Hello, welcome to Ethics. My name is Mark Thorsby, and in this video series, we've been looking at Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Today, we're going to be taking a look at Aristotle's um, eighth book of the Nicomachean Ethics, which concerns friendship. Uh, hopefully, you've been watching the series, and, and you have a sense of all the different things that Aristotle has been discussing. For instance, in the I won't go through it all, but some of the key points is Aristotle's articulation that happiness is an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. And we've looked at what some of those virtues are. In particular, we looked at justice, temperance, courage, and a number of others. Uh, but we also looked at the problem of incontinence and also the, the question, the subject of pleasure. Now, what we're going to see in this section is Aristotle turns his attention to the subject of friendship. Because Aristotle thinks that friendship is an absolutely necessary condition for living life. He says it's necessary for life. He even fact says that friendship is its own excellence. It is its own sort of virtue. Um, and some of the things that, some of the common beliefs and common basic ideas that, that Aristotle points out regarding friendship is that, for instance, friendship can help the young to keep from error. So the youth, right? So it's important for people, especially young people, he says, to have friends so that their friends can help them avoid making mistakes, right? It's pretty simple. And think about this. Who do you first go to when you, you're faced with a major problem? Many times the first person you go to are your friends, right? So it, ancient, the ancient Greek world is not that much different from ours regarding friendship. Another thing is that friendship stimulates uh, the noble action in the prime of one's life. So to live, to do, act nobly, he's already had a sustained discussion on what the noble means, but uh, friendship helps stimulate this noble action when you're in the prime of your life. Uh, parents feel friendship for their children, and also children seem to feel friendship for their parents, at least when they get older. <laughs> friendship also, he says, is found among the birds and most animals. So for Aristotle, friendship is something that is most essential to life. Um, and it's not just uh, something that's important for humans, but it's also important for the animals. So I thought this was sort of interesting, so I thought I'd point it out. In fact, he even goes on to say at the end here that it looks like that the truest form of justice is a type of friendship. So we'll see Aristotle make an interesting comparison in uh, discussion between justice and friendship. So the question though is how... How can we define friendship and how should it be defined? Now, Aristotle doesn't define friendship here, but what he does do is, I'll probably take this off, I'm hot in here, but what he does do is he sort of glosses over some of the possibilities that have been offered regarding how friendship can be defined. The first idea is that it looks like friendship is a kind of likeness. So maybe it's the idea that two people who are friends are like each other, and they, they not only like each other, but they also have a likeness of each other, right? They're similar. So is friendship a sort of likeness? Um, here he, he mentions the phrase, or at least the treatise later does, birds of a feather flock together. So one possibility is maybe we define friendship as like-minded individuals who, um, who are in some sort of communion, communion or some sort of relationship with each other. But the problem is this doesn't seem to be completely satisfactory because at least other philosophers have argued the opposite. For instance, Euripides seems to argue that opposites attract. And he gives, the, he, uh, Aristotle quotes Euripides, uh, a verse of his that says, parched earth loves rain. So um, in the same sense, you can think of the rain and the parched earth, they're friends, maybe opposites attract. Heraclitus says something similar, right? He says, from different tones, different, I'm sorry, from different co tones comes, um, comes through the truest tune. So there the idea is when you have people who are different and they work together, something better comes out of them. So you can become better out of the two. And there the idea is, seems to be something like um, the friendship is more than the sum of its parts, right? And he also quotes um, Empedocles, uh, which said, it goes back to the notion of likeness. And it's in his argument is that like aims at like. So Things which are similar always seem to be attracted towards each other. So this sort of raises, just sort of briefly for Aristotle, a quick sketch about some of the possibilities for thinking about friendship. But at the end of this section, Aristotle sort of left with, well, how many species of friendship are there? How many types of friends are there? And this takes Aristotle to the next sort of, well, it doesn't take him yet to the distinction of types of friendship, but the next thing he moves here is the object of friendship. So 
if we're going to have a good definition and understanding of friendship, we have, and we know that friendship is a relationship between at least two people coming together, there must be a third thing, a third term, which binds those friends together. So you can ask here, what is the object of friendship? Uh, Aristotle suggests that, well, friendship is a kind of love, so what is the object for, of love for a friendship? Well, in other words, what object governs the relationship between two friends? Now, his first suggestion here is that, well, the object of friendship must be good, right? Because friendship is something that we, we consider good, and it's something we desire really for its own sake in many cases. Um, so the object of friendship has to be something good and pleasant, right? So notice here when Aristotle says that friend, the object of friendship must be good, he's articulating a, basically um, a value claim about the object of friendship, but he also says that the object of friendship is pleasant. So that means that not only is there, is, if you will, a moral dimension to friendship, <clears throat> there's also a hedonistic dimension. Or in other words, there's the dimension of pleasure, because whenever Aristotle used the term pleasant, he's thinking of pleasure in particular, right? So here we can ask, well, but is it the good, or I'm sorry, Aristotle asked, is it the good or is it what is good for them as friends that's the object of friendship? In other words, you can say, is the object of friendship goodness itself or is it the good that is related to the friends, right? So is it a uh, unqualified goodness or is it a qualified or relative form of goodness? Well, in order to answer this question, Aristotle suggests that there's three forms of love, really, three grounds of love. Um, and when we talk about love, we're talking about always there has to be two entities. Now, the first form of love, which is not friendship, is the love of a lifeless object. So people say they love their cars, they love their houses, or they, they love going on vacation. And maybe they do love these things, but they love a lifeless object. So obviously this form of love, right, where you have one entity and you have the person who loves, this obviously is not friendship because friendship requires two people. So the next form of love would be what we what he refers to really as non-reciprocal goodwill. Um, again, my apologies for some of these spelling errors. Um, I, have, I keep seeing them. For some reason, I type quick in there. I'm using this. Some people always ask me what program I use. I use Prezi. And this new program, this, there's a new version of Prezi out which doesn't have spell check, which makes it even more hard, more difficult for me. Not more hard, but more difficult. I mean, but back to the study here. Non-reciprocal goodwill is the idea of someone has goodwill for another, but it's not reciprocated. Um, so, for instance, uh, think about the love that the a, a, a priest may have for uh, a person he sees on the street. So he may express love for that person. Maybe he sees them and they need food, but that may not be reciprocated back, back towards you. Um, another example would be having goodwill towards people you don't know, strangers. Um, so, for instance, imagine if I give money to help people in, um, let's say, Puerto Rico that's just recently, as of 2017, was devastated by a hurricane. So if I give money, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm, I have a certain sort of love towards the Puerto Ricans when I give my money, but it's non-reciprocal, right? So this isn't friendship either. Um, and the third, of course, is reciprocal goodwill, and this seems to be... Um, what he has in mind when he thinks of friendship. So, so the friend, so two friends love each other. So friendship is a form of love um, that is reciprocal in both directions. So if you will, friendship is a two-way street. And so that means that if we're going to consider the object of love, well, the object of love, friendship, not the object of love, but the object of friendship has to be something that's reciprocally grounded in the relationship. Now, what is that object exactly? Well, here we can begin to distinguish the three types of friendship. So the first type of friendship is probably the most common. And this is what Aristotle refers to as a friendship of utility. In other words, the friends here, utility refers to use. So these are friends of usefulness. So in other words, words when two people have a reciprocal relationship of goodwill towards each other, but the object that, that around which... Um, that friendship is generated is something that's useful for each, then what you have is a friendship of utility. Think here, for instance, about the if you've ever worked a job and you became friends with the people at your job, 
right? That would be a friendship of utility. You're friends not because uh, you may eventually become really good friends with people at work, but most of the time, the people you work with, you're friends with them, but only at work. So, for instance, when you quit your job, you don't continue to know who they are, for instance, uh, or you lose track of them or something like that. So for Aristotle, friendship of utility, quote, is some good which they get from each other. There's some good which they get from each other. So he says that this form of friendship is taken by the elderly or by the aged. Um, and that's because he thinks that um, as people get older, um, ultimately they, they essentially um, slowly are just interested in the usefulness. They, they meet other people in terms of utility. So... Uh, he thinks that that's sort of interesting. I don't know if that's always true, but that was his view. Uh, their love is for the sake of themselves. So the friendship of utility is a friendship where the love is ultimately towards the towards the person who's the, who's doing the loving. So in other words, if I'm a friendship of utility and you're we're friends of utility, that means that we ultimately are interested in doing something that's useful for ourselves, and this this entails a friendship with another person, but it's still sort of self love ultimately. They, and these are incidental friendships, which means that they're short-lived. They sort of happen and they go away. The second form of friendship is what you might call erotic friendship, or uh, in some translations they'll say uh, amorous relationship friendship. So erotic friendship clearly is friendship, right, with regards to sexual pleasure, right? So the object of this friendship is pleasure. So, so we could say that there's a reciprocality, but ultimately in an erotic friendship, it's the pleasure for yourself that you're after. Um, so you can imagine here two people come together and they have intimate, um, they make love with each other and they have intimate relations. Well, for Aristotle, this friendship is, the goal of this friendship is pleasure. And ultimately it's the pleasure you're seeking for yourself, but it's reciprocal towards each other. This sort of friendship is emotional, it's passionate. And he says it's frequently found in the youth uh, who are given to emotion and passion uh, and so forth. So he thinks that erotic friendships can last, but they can also be very short-lived too. So he gives the example of a young person who falls in and out of love very easily and very quickly, sometimes even in the same day. So we have this notion of erotic friendship. The third type of friendship is what you might call perfect or complete friendship. Now this is a sort of friendship of people who are good. So he does it, whereas erotic and erotic friendship or utilitarian friendship, these, anyone can have these. He thinks that complete friendship requires a person to actually be morally good, which means they have to have virtuous excellence, right? Uh, this requires virtue. Be, and this is because in each of these friendships, I'm sorry, in the perfect friendship, each friend wishes the other well qua good. That is, they want the other person to do well, then they have goodwill for them, but they have goodwill because Goodwill in the sense that they desire the, the good itself. So this friendship is the most long-lasting. This is, if you will, the friendship that lasts a lifetime. And these friendships are infrequent. In other words, you don't have a lot of these friendships. In fact, he says that the person who has lots of friendships can't have complete friendship. Um, quote, those who quickly show the marks of friendship pardon me, to each other wish to be friends but are not friends unless they are both lovable and know the fact. For a wish of friendship may arise quickly, but friendship does not. So there's this notion here also that not only perfect friendship, but yeah, in particular perfect or complete friendship takes a long time to develop. So it's not something that you can have right away. So we do talk about people who, uh, think about when people say we fell in love instantly. Well, they're usually referring there to an erotic friendship, right? That is, they, they found each other pleasing, um, and then they pursued each other um, sexually or something like this. But people who are best friends, this takes a lot of time to develop. Even you may quickly realize that you want to have a friendship with another person, but to actually develop that friendship takes time. And it requires you to ultimately live, uh, live a life in common with that other person. So from here we can sort of begin to sort of link up and talk about the different types of friendship and how they relate. So a friendship of utility, the object is usefulness, or that which is the useful. Its duration lasts long if needed, right? So this is a lasting form of friendship so long as the utility element remains. 
Now, who can have this sort of friendship? Both the good people and bad people. Now, the erotic friendship, by contrast, the object is that which is pleasurable. And he says that this, this friendship tends to change uh, over time. And that's because, if you recall in our section on pleasure, Aristotle talked about the idea that because we're changing, because we're always changing as human beings, what's pleasurable to us is always changing, which means that the erotic friendship is always changing. And this is a type, who can have this sort of friendship? Both good people and bad people, because both good and bad people can have pleasure. In fact, you recall that Aristotle says that the good person doesn't necessarily have a more pleasurable life than the bad person. Um, and that's because it, pleasure concerns one's natural state and so on and so forth. So this is sort of interesting. So you can imagine here is that if you have a relationship that's purely based upon eroticism or sex, then it's not a surprise that uh, that friendship won't last. Why? Because people get used to certain sorts of pleasures. And when you become accustomed to a pleasure, it no longer becomes pleasurable. Think about if you if you go to a really nice restaurant. The first time you go to a really nice restaurant and have the food for the first time, it's amazing. But as you keep going back, even though the food may be the same, you become accustomed to it, and then you start to desire something else that will give you pleasure. This is the same for sex or, or other forms of erotic intimacy, is that as you uh, maintain that sort of relationship, what happens is you will eventually become accustomed to it and you will begin to seek change. So erotic friendships don't seem to last long. Now, the perfect and complete friendship is the one that is lasting. And this is the, the object is the good qua good. That is, you have the goodwill for the other person because you've cultivated and you have a desire for the good, right? You desire the good for its own sake. And so in other words, who does this? Well, the, the good person is the only person who can have the good, the complete or perfect friendship. And because this is, you desire the good for each other qua good. Now, what Aristotle says is that these are all essential forms of friendship and that these three are exhaustive and that there are maybe other sort of types of friendship, but all of these other types are either variations or merely just incidental forms of friendship. These three look to be pretty succinctly um, succinct in terms of their ability to capture the forms of friendship we have. Now, this leads us to then look at the state and activity of friendship. And here we can we have to recognize that well a friendship can either be an activity it's doing something with another person and most of the time of course this is a necessary condition you can't be friends if you never do anything with another person um, but this is the idea that this is a friendship in terms of an activity is when we live life together and we enjoy and confer each other benefits right um, and it depends on the, what the, those benefits depend on what the friendship is in the situation so. The benefits of a friendship of utility are benefits that are useful. The benefits of an erotic friendship are ones which are erotic. And the benefits of a complete friendship are benefits which are good qua good, right? Um, now, we have activities of friendship, but Aristotle also thinks that friendship is also a state. That is, it's a type of being. It's a form of being. And here you can recognize that this whatever state of friendship there is, it has to include a disposition towards the activity of friendship. So it looks like here, so he gives the example of imagine two friends who've moved away. That is, for example, friends who are locally separated. And here I can think of, I have a really, really good friend of mine, Jake, um, and I don't live in the same town as him anymore. We actually used to live together uh, as roommates for a long time ago. And we've known each other for years, and we've done lots of activities together. But since we don't live near each other, we no longer have the activity of friendship like we would like. But we still have a state of friendship. That is, we are eternally disposed towards each other, towards acting well towards each other. And of course, when we go and see each other after a long uh, time, and we travel and see each other, it's as if our friendship just picks up right where it is, and where it left off. And so friendship can either be an activity or it can be a state. Now for Aristotle, the, a friendship ultimately means that in some way you have to live life together. And he says you have to, it's not only about being well disposed towards the other person, but you actually have to incorporate and share each other's life. Uh, and in particular, just live with each other. He says, quote, Now it looks as if love were a passion, friendship is state, 
For love may be felt just as much towards lifeless things, but mutual love involves choice. A choice springs from a state, and men wish those men wish well to those whom they love for their sake, not as a result of passion, but as a result of a state. So here you can see here he's trying to articulate that there really is a state of friendship with regard to one's character. Now, but let's turn and look at what about the activities of friendship. How can we understand these activities? Well, first thing Aristotle mentions that well, friendship arises less readily for sour and grumpy people, right? So people who are sour and grumpy, he by the way, Aristotle doesn't use the term grumpy. He said the term given to us in the translation is sour, but I like the term grumpy because <laughs> I know lots of people who are grumpy. Um, and, and those people, it's hard for them to have friendships. Um, why? Because it's harder for them to uh, reciprocally uh, give to the other person or to receive from the other person. He also says that friendship arises less readily for the elderly people. So people who have become far advanced in years do not seem to gain lots of new friendships. And this seems to be the case. So for instance, I think here about my own uh, father who has friends, but over the years as he's, get, as he's gotten older and older, he has less and less of a desire to enter into friendships, um, especially complete friendships. He has them still, uh, but I don't think that he's seeking to gain more of them. Uh, in fact, it looks like, and Aristotle suggests, is that for people who, 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 who grow older, the sorts of friendships, new friendships that they, they have tend to be friendships of utility. Uh, that is because of some for useful reason, they begin to, to become friends with other people. So friendship seems to arise less readily for the elderly. Now, this be, he says that there are two primary marks of friendship. So you can ask yourself, how, are you my friend? And he says there's two sorts of criteria that seem, there seem to be. Number one is you spend time together, right? You have to be with the other person. And number two, you delight in each other. Um, that is, you get pleasure from being with each other. So lots of time with each other, but also there's a delight and a pleasure of being with the other person. These seem to be the two primary general marks for friendship. Now, he does say that when we talk about friendship, what we have to also recognize is that in life, there's going to be few complete or perfect friendships. So there's not quite as many of those sorts of activities of friendship, uh, but there is a lot of activity of friendship for friends of utility and erotic friendship. Now, let's, let's move here to look at utilitarian friendship or friendship of utility. Aristotle suggests that the friendship of utility is, number one, commercially minded. So it looks like most of the activities that are quote-unquote useful if, that we engage in with other people we don't know, but then become friends with those people, it looks like those relationships are organized around economics. Uh, they're organized around making money and living life and having a job and making a living, as it's said. So, uh, so that's one thing. Now, here we can say is that Aristotle then begins to discuss, what about people in authority? Remember, Aristotle's always interested here in the dimension of political science here. Uh, but also notice that in a commercial setting, there are people who do have authority. Uh, think, for instance, that you may become friends with your boss, but your boss is still in authority. So what about people in authority? They seem to have distinct classes of friendship. So Aristotle sort of isolates that people who are in authority have friends who are useful, they have friends who are pleasant, and they also have friends who are ready-witted and clever. But it doesn't look like these characteristics are frequently found uh, in the same person. So that, in other words, they're rarely found in the same person. Uh, but these friendships are still reciprocal in his sense. Uh, there's still an equality of friendship. Uh, it is true that the, these friendships, both the commercially minded utility friendships or the authority forms of friendship, are less, not as truly friends in the way we think of a perfect friend or a best friend, and they, and they are less permanent too. And that's a way in which we can also recognize they lack perfection. Now, this leads Aristotle to the discussion of what about friendship between unequals? And again, sorry for that little typo there. Um, here, what are we talking about when we say unequal friendship? Well, unequal friendship concerns, for instance, the... the um, the friendship between a father and a son, uh, the relationship between an elder and a youth, or the relationship between a husband and a wife. Now, here I put in red, 
Aristotle says that the relationship between a husband and wife is like that of a relationship between the ruler and the subject or the person who's ruled. So I put this in red because this appears to be a sort of uh, one of Aristotle's forms of sexism, right? Because um, for him, he doesn't think that you can have an equal friendship between a husband and a wife because for him, obviously the husband or the man it ultimately has is superior in some sense. Today, we don't think that, or at least I certainly don't think that. So I would tend to, tend to put the husband and wife friendship in an equal setting rather than the elder, the youth, the father, and the son. But nevertheless, this is how he uh, articulates it. So th if you're interested in writing all this, for instance, maybe you're, writing a, you're gonna be writing a paper on this, Maybe that's something you'd like to dig out. I think there's a potential criticism against Aristotle's discussion of friendship precisely here because it looks like he's just smuggling in his own cultural biases into his analysis of friendship. And if he's doing that for the husband and wife relationship, is, it, is he also potentially doing that for the father, son, the elder, youth relationships, examples he gives? But anyway, let's move on here. The excellence or the virtue and the function of each of these friendships are going to be different. So the father's form of excellence is different from the son's form of excellence and so on and so forth. And, and maybe that's what he has in mind here is that the husband's form of excellence is going to be different from the wife's form of excellence. That might be a way to potentially resurrect or save Aristotle from his, his chauvinism here. And, and here the idea would be is that the excellence... And here, you don't even have to go husband and wife. Imagine between a partner and a partner. So imagine you have two gay men or two gay women. Um, even there, because of the relationship, right, there does seem to be a, a situation in which um, each, each spouse will take on different functions and then ha thereby have different forms of excellence. Um, so you can, for instance, usually in a relationship, one person is better at doing finances than another person, right? So maybe there's a way to think about the inequality of friendship still with regard to husband and wife that isn't necessarily bound to a sort of sex, a d dimension of sexism, uh, which devalues a woman's, devalues a woman as being subordinate to a man. Now, anyway, let's keep, keep going. While reciprocal, so for him, we should say this is that even though in these unequal friendships, there, there's an inequality, right? One person is superior versus another person is inferior in some role, right? They're still reciprocal, right? So the love um, to each is what, the, the love that each has is not equal, but the love is still reciprocal. Therefore, these, fr these friendships really imply a proportional form of love between the friends. So maybe this is how we can understand un unequal friendships is they're essentially proportionate love. So I love you in proportion to your uh, relationship to me, right? Um, and so on and so forth. So that means that we can talk about the proportionate virtue of friends. And we can say that friendship cannot survive drastic shifts in virtue. Um, and this is sort of a point that goes for both equal and unequal friendships, which is namely Aristotle argues that Friends have certain virtues, but in order for friends to remain friends, they have to have a comparable, proportionate sense of virtue. Um, so, for instance, imagine if you have two friends and there's a drastic shift in virtue. Imagine, for instance, you find out that your best friend is a serial killer, right? Well, at that point, it may no longer be possible for you to be friends, right? Your friendship may just dissolve suddenly because of a shift in virtue or a shift in the character of excellence that another person has. And what it does also look like is that, is that friends naturally are friends with people who have similar virtues, right? So for instance, uh, put it this way, if I think it's all right to steal, then it's likely that the friends I have also think it's all right to steal. Now, of course, for Aristotle, will be an example where bad people can be friends. Um, but you can imagine a whole bunch of different ranges like that. Um, imagine two people who are always honest and then suddenly one starts lying all the time. Well, that's a change of virtue, right? That's a movement of excess. And that is going to ultimately either really challenge or ultimately perhaps destroy a friendship or dissolve a friendship. Okay. Now, Aristotle then turns to the question of giving and receiving. Because obviously friends give to each other and friends receive things from each other. 
And he says that friendship depends more on loving ultimately than being loved. So in other words, friendship is more essentially aligned with giving than it is receiving, um, though it does involve both, right? So for instance, uh, it see, most people think that, uh, that it's better to be loved rather than to love. And Aristotle gives the example of flattery. So the person who is flattering another person is giving a certain form of love toward that other person, or at least making them think that they're loved. Uh, but he says, for instance, that's not ultimately going to be sufficient, right? Uh, one of the things here is that what we need is something that's required to enable a long-lasting friendship. And if our relationship is one where I just receive from you, then that's not going to be a long-lasting friendship at all. Now, he does talk here about parents, right? And he says, for instance, if you look at the unequal friendships between a parent and a child, what you see is that a parent automatically loves their child, whereas a child isn't going to begin to love their parent until they've gained some sort of understanding. So what, one of the things he thinks here is that motherhood reveals the priority of loving for unequal friendship. Um, thus, through the activity of loving and giving, do unequal friends... Uh, enjoy their reciprocal relationship. So, is it better to be loved or to lo is it better to love or to be loved? The answer for Aristotle is that it's better to love. Uh, so, it's better to give than to receive, as it were. Now, you can talk about wicked friendships. Now, wicked friendships are friendships where you enjoy the wickedness of the other person, or you enjoy being with another person in terms of doing wicked things. But he says the problem here is that wicked friends friendships just don't last. Uh, they don't last because ultimately there's not enough stamina. Um, and, and obviously, the, it, why is there not enough stamina? Because remember, a wicked person is a person who lives according to the vices. A vice is an, something that is excessive or deficient. Um, so if you have a friendship that's based upon excess or deficiency, well, that's not going to be balanced enough to maintain the fidelity that's needed to continue that friendship going forward into the future. Now, friendships, he then begins to think about friendships and the role that friendships play in communities and within a social setting, right? And this also brings us back to the question in the subject of justice. Aristotle writes, quote, Friendship and justice seem to be concerned with the same objects and exhibited between the same persons. For in every community, there's thought to be some form of justice and friendship too. So for Aristotle, Friendship and justice seem to go hand in hand. Every community has uh, has justice, uh, some form of justice, and it, every community has some form of friendship because every community is a social organization. And social organizations require us to work with each other in some degree. Now, I would say the primary form of friendship we see in the community is probably friendships of, of utility, Right. Obviously, there have to be erotic friendships if there's going to be a community. You have to have sex in order for there to be people at all. Um, so erotic friendship is necessary. But ultimately, forms of complete friendship are rarer. And it looks like communities need them because ultimately, um, it, only just and good people can have these, right? And justice is a central ingredient for every community too, right? And justice also concerns the relationships that people have with each other. Aristotle says that the extent and the relation of justice are parallel in terms of their type of association. So that means sort of kind of, if I have an association, let's say I'm relating with other people in terms of a commercial setting, then the sorts of friendships I have and the demands of justice are going to run in parallel with each other. And from a friendship of utility to an erotic friendship to a complete friendship, what you see is uh, increasing demands of justice, right? And so here, here you can think about it. Think about what, what you owe the person from work who you're friends with. And then think, well, also, what, what do you owe the person that you're in love with? And then finally, what about the person you've known your whole life who you have the perfect, complete friendship with? Your true best friend, as it were, of your PFF. Um, in this, you're going to have the greatest demands of justice. You owe the most to that final person. So it looks here that these uh, forms of friendship also have increasing uh, degrees of justice, right? Or here I put it here. The demands of justice increase with friendship, especially for friends of equality. So you have sort of 
every community needs justice, and it looks like justice requires friendship. Uh, every community definitely requires both justice and friendship. Now, all communities are a part of the political community, and particular kinds of friendship will correspond to the particular kinds of community. So in other words, Aristotle recognizes that whenever you have a friendship, every friendship is its own sort of community, and you can have multiple communities within other communities. So think here about the way in which we have subcultures within a greater, larger culture. Um, every community has a variety of subcultures or sub-communities within them. And he thinks that the different types of friendship that you have are going to correspond to these different kinds of community. Okay, so now this is very interesting. This is sort of mainly just about politics, but he's going to relate it to friendship. Is he then talks for a moment about the different forms of political system. And so we get a sense of Aristotle's political commitments here. Now, the first thing is, for Aristotle, there's basic three forms of constitutional government. And I should say there's three forms of political system political systems that can constitute a community. Uh, the first one is a monarchy. Now, every one of these political systems has its own uh, deviation. It has its, its bad form. So if you have monarchy, the opposite of monarchy is a tyranny. Now, in both a monarchy and a tyranny, you have a singular ruler, right? The difference, though, is that the monarch is the one who should pursue the good of the community, whereas the tyrant pursues their own good, right? And in Aristotle's view, monarchy is the best form of government, whereas tyranny is the worst form of deviation. So in other words, when you have a good king or a good queen or a good monarch who rules wisely, then you have the best chance of having the best type of society, right? Because you have a singular wisdom that is governing all things, right? Um, but on the other hand, if you have a person who's in charge of everything and they're doing evil, well, then this is going to be a nightmare. It's the worst form of government. So you can see here is that monarchy could be the best or the worst um, in the most extreme sense. And notice here that monarchy it does seem to be a type of uh, excess, potentially, uh, though Aristotle doesn't say that. Now, the next form of government is an aristocracy, and its form of deviation is an oligarchy. oligarchy. Now, an aristocracy is uh, when the few rule, the noble rule. So uh, Aristotle's notion here is that you have the aristocrats or the noble class. These are the people who are wisest, have the most uh, means. They usually have wealth, uh, but they're also the highest citizens. But if you recall, for Aristotle, the person who's a part of the aristocracy acts for the what's noble and honorable, right? So for him, aristocracy is a great form of government, um, right? But its reverse is oligarchy, right? And oligarchy is when you essentially have family rule um, or you have the wealthy rule. Um, and this is very problematic. The difference about whether or not you have an aristocracy or an oligarchy concerns whether the rulers are good or bad. If they're bad rulers, then it's an oligarchy. If they're good rulers, he calls it an aristocracy. Now, the last form of government or constitution for him is what he calls the timocratic. And the democratic form of government is the government that's organized around property relationships. Um, and, and its deviation is what he calls democracy. And in both the democratic or the democratic, you have the many or who rule. Now, it's the democratic is primarily concerned with property. Lots of people have property. And everyone's property has to be equally related. In other words, you have to respect everyone else's property equally, even if you don't have equal property itself. So that means that equality among the many is one of the primary conditions for a democratic government. Now, he says that in the deviation of this, of the democratic government, is democracy. And here, of course, remember, he's living in Athens, right? So he's thinking particularly about Athens and Athens history. And he says that democracy is the least bad of all the deviations. So it's interesting. Democracy is probably the least good, but it's also the the best uh, bad form of government in his view, right? Because when the many rule, there's still always going to be sort of protections for the many. So you can see Aristotle is not a fan of democracy, but he doesn't think democracy is the absolute worst form of government. Certainly uh, tyranny is that, right? Um, so you can see here is that what Aristotle is doing here is he recognizes that 
when we look at these different forms of government, we can recognize that there's an analogy between the family and politics. So he says, for instance, this, that when we compare a parent to a child, or we talk in terms of a, a guardian, what we have is a monar monarchical relationship. Right? Now, he says that if you treat a child as a slave, then what you have is tyranny. Right? Um, think about, for instance, in, he gives the, Aristotle gives the example of the Persians. I'm not as familiar with Persian history of child rearing, um, so that example didn't quite work for me as well as it did for Aristotle. But I think here about, um, uh, think of those, those movies, I think of the movie, um, uh, think of the movie Harry Potter, if you've seen that film, and think of the way his step-parents treat him, right? Or think about those fairy tales, think about Cinderella and the way that her guardian treated her. She was treated as a slave. So in this case, what you have is that you have a tyrannical relationship. So you can see here is that when we talk about the relationships in a family, they can, they can both be monarchical, good, where the parent governs the child wisely and correctly, or wrongly, which would be a tyranny. Now, when you think about spouses, and for Aristotle, he says, what about the relationship between a wife and a husband? He says that this relationship is closely associated with an aristocracy, where each seems to rule according to their merit. So he says, uh, but he says, for instance, that when a man tries to rule everything in the household, what you have is an oligarchy. So that would be the deviation. So this would be good evidence to support the claim that Aristotle may not be as sexist as we were suggesting earlier. Because he's not suggesting, because whereas earlier he did suggest that the relationship between a man and a wife is a relationship of the, the ruled and the subject. Here we get the notion that, no, he has more of a meritocracy um, sense in terms of the relationship between spouses, right? And then finally, when you think about brothers and sisters, the relationship between siblings, he says this is timocratic. And that's because each of the ch siblings is equal before the other. And he says, of course, where everyone has a license to do anything they please, you have a disaster, right? So if all the brothers and sisters and all the children just do whatever they want and it's democratic, uh, it's quite problematic, right? Um, so, so he thinks that, there, that we can sort of align these systems of government and use them as a filter for thinking about the relationships of the household themselves. Now, we can also talk about friendships in the political systems themselves, right? So I got a couple quotes here I'll mention, right, which or read to you. Number one is that the justice, therefore, that exists between persons so related is not the same, but proportioned to merit, for that is true of friendship as well. So his notion here is that within a political system, the justice that exists between these persons is related to their merit and related to uh, what is appropriate and proportional to that, those relationships, right? But he goes on to say that, but in the deviation forms, right, in the tyranny in the oligarchy and in the democracy, justice hardly exists and neither does friendship. So too does friendship. So in the sense that tyranny is the worst form of government, you see no friendship. Uh, but in democracy, it has more friendships since it's not the absolute worst form of government since there still is some equality. And where there's equality, there's some sort of reciprocality. Uh, so... You can see sort of this interesting discussion of friendship here. Now, he also, of course, then does discuss friendships and families in more concrete terms, right? He recognized that every friendship requires an association between parties. That is, there has to be some reason or some uh, central condition or context out of which different parties come together in friendship. Now, we do seem to make a difference here between family and our comrades, that is, Friends versus family, as it were. That's how we normally probably say it, at least in the United States. So there's a couple key points here. Let's see if I can zoom in here. Um, he says, well, for instance, when we look at family, and mainly he's interested in looking at family here rather than the com camaraderie friendship. He says, the parents love their children immediately while, oh, I already mentioned this, right? I must have, I must have got the slides confused. Parents love their children immediately while children only love after having acquired understanding of their parents, right? Mothers seem to love their children more than fathers. Um, and he also recognizes that parents love their children as they love themselves. And maybe that's why parents love their children immediately, because they see their children as extensions 
of themselves, right? And here you can see that from a mother's perspective, their child literally is an extension of, of themselves. Um, so, I mean, that's a literal thing. So I guess technically that's true for fathers, but obviously in a much more visceral way when you think about a woman who has to literally labor and give birth as the child co comes out of them, right? Which is, I can only imagine, is totally wild uh, for a person to experience. Now, he thinks there are two contributing factors that do help enable friendship. And one is this common upbringing in the similar age. And this seems to be true both for people in family and siblings in particular. But think about people who are just com comrades. Um, the closer you are in terms of your upbringing, because remember, it's in your upbringing that you get your habits. Remember Aristotle talked about the development of habits. And he talked about how habits contribute to how we gain our virtues. Um, so... That in this relationship, which means that if we have a common upbringing, we probably will have common virtues, which means that there's a, a relationship of reciprocality already sort of primed and built in. Um, and also, we need to be of similar age and similar station, it looks like, within life. Um, so one of the things that's interesting, and, and he doesn't really say this, but I think it's worth mentioning, is that when we he does talk about utility and eroticism to some degree, but the spouses, when we talk about people who are uh, spouses or people who are who are life partners or whatnot, what we see is that they can be friends of utility and eroticism and maybe complete perfect friendship. So think about it: when you have two people who live together um, or people who are married, right? Obviously, you have eroticism, right? They have sex with each other uh, and they're intimate with each other. But most of the relationship actually is doing things that are useful. So, for instance, I'm married and. I won't go into it, but I do have an erotic relationship with my wife. Um, but most of my actual relation with my wife is spent doing things that we have to do. So it's things like paying the bills, watching TV, raising our kids, picking things up from the store, you know, going grocery shopping. Most of my relationship is actually a relationship of utility. Um, and then over time, and I think this is true at least in my marriage, is we've now developed a complete friendship a friendship that goes beyond either eroticism or utility. So spouses are sort of interesting here. And Aristotle talks about the idea that human beings naturally couple off with each other. And so he sees this as a natural sort of thing that people do. Uh, now, we do recognize that in the end of the book here, in sections 13 and 14, Aristotle begins to talk a little bit about the disputes that can arise between friendships. In section 13, he talks about the disputes that arise between friendships of equality. And then in 14, he talks about friendships of inequality. And I've pulled out a couple quotes here that might be helpful for you. He says, equals must affect the required equalization. So if you have a dispute between two friends, then in order to resolve that dispute, you have to re-equalize your relationship in some way. So equals have to affect the required equalization on a basis of equality in love and in all other respects. Well, unequals must render or equalize uh, what is in proportion to their superiority or inferiority. So that means that if you have a dispute between friends of equality, then that means that the dispute has to concern the entire equality relationship. Whereas if you have a dispute between any unequals, then the dispute has to be resolved um, in proportion to the relation. So that means that, for instance, if I have, like, I have a, an equality, I have a, a friendship of equality with my wife. Um, and so when we have a dispute, we have to resolve that dispute uh, because it affects our entire relationship, right? And that's because we're equal to each other. Whereas, for instance, if I had a, a dispute with my children, I don't have to resolve my entire relationship in order to solve that dispute. I just have to resolve the relationship in terms of proportion of me being their parent or, or in how that might affect something, right? So, and one thing that's interesting, he says that out of all the friendships, not fear and ships, but friendships, uh, not fire and ships, but friendships, friendships of utility have the most disputes. And this is because when, um, well, let's take it through. A friendship of, co a complete friendship is a friendship that's lo that's last over a lifetime and you've really gotten to know each other. So there's not as many disputes because you've essentially worked through all of those disputes. A friendship of 
erotic, an erotic friendship doesn't have a lot of disputes, he says, because in an erotic friendship, the goal is pleasure. So as long as you have this reciprocating pleasure, then there's not a lot of disputes that arise out of that. Um, so for instance, in other words, as long as if two people are making love, as long as they're enjoying it, what's the dispute, right? Uh, but when you come to a friendship of utility, which is actually where most of our friendships actually are, uh, because it's about what's useful, we can have lots of disputes because things are always things are useful only with regard to the context of what we need them for. Um, and so this is where our friendships seem, our debates and our our fights seem to arise. Now. How are you supposed to figure out a dispute? He says, well, the measure of a dispute concerns the advantage of the receiver. So here, remember, when we talk about friendship of utility, we're talking about giving and receiving, right, as part of it. Though giving and receiving applies to all friendships. And the person who receives, if the person has, uh, the person who receives is the, on the receiving end uh, has greater advantage, right, or doesn't have, a, or has a worse advantage, then this is where the dispute arises. Because friendship structurally is this reciprocal relationship between people. Now, disputes between unequal friends, and I pulled three sort of quotes to sort of uh, reference some of the things he talks about. He says, differences arise also in friendship based upon superiority, for each expects to get more out of them. But when this happens, the friendship is dissolved. So if I have a friendship and I expect to get more out of it, then is related to the proportionate need, then the friendship dissolves. The other problem here is that, quote, for no one puts up with the smaller share uh, forever, right? Uh, so you do get a sense that if you're in a relationship, but you feel like you're the one who's constantly doing all the work, eventually that relationship will dissolve. In fact, this happened to my mom. I won't say with who in case this person ever watches the video, but she had a really good friend who seemed to be one of her complete long-lasting friends. But over the years, uh, the relationship became essentially just one-sided. It looked like primarily my mom had to do all of the work, and she was always giving, and the other friend was always receiving, but it was it, it no longer became re it, reciprocal. And, be, and, and eventually, my mom just cut off the friendship. She said, I don't want to be your friend anymore because... I don't feel like I have a friend. I feel like I'm your friend, but not the other way around. So no one will put up with the smaller share indefinitely in a in a disproportionate not in a disproportionately reciprocal relationship or non-reciprocal relationship. He also says that this then is also the way in which we should associate with unequals. The man who has benefited in respect of wealth or virtue must give honor in return, repaying what he can. For friendship, ask a man to do what he can, not what is proportionate to the merits of the case. So here we get this sense that when you have friendship between unequals, that ultimately the only way to really resolve those disputes isn't simply to give what's proportionate, but to give in return, to give what you can. Uh, and here you have sort of the notion that of the authentic friend versus the friend who's inauthentic, right? The friend who gives just because they have to have to. Um, and that's not really friendship, now, is it? So Aristotle sort of discusses that briefly, and then he sort of concludes that. Now, that concludes our video uh, sort of tour of Aristotle's uh, Nicomachean Ethics, book 8. We'll see in the next book, book 9, Aristotle actually is going to continue the discussion of friendship and go forward. Uh, there's only two more videos left in this series on Aristotle's Ethics. We have book uh, 9, and, uh, which sort of continues the discussion of friendship. And then we have book 10, which is going to kind of finally wrap it all up here. So thanks again for watching, and I look forward to seeing you guys online.